Today, we are honored to welcome Professor Faranak Miraftab. Faranak Miraftab is a professor of urban and regional planning, gender and women's studies at the University of Illinois Urbane Champaign. She is also affiliated with the geography and geographic information science at the same university. Professor Miraftab research, Miraftab's research focuses on social and institutional aspects of urban development and planning. She is particularly interested and in, uh, expands, explores the, glo in the global and local development processes and contingencies involved in the formation of the city and citizens' struggles for dignified livelihood, namely how groups disadvantaged by class, gender, race, and ethnicity mobilize for resources for shelter, such as shelter, basic infrastructure, and services, and how institutional arrangements facilitate and frustrate provision and access to such vital urban resources. Professor Muraftab's research and teaching spanned several regions, including the Middle East, Southern Africa, and North America. So you see that there is a very broad span. She worked on the experiences of low-income communities, particularly female-headed households, as well as struggles for justice, and equity through the experience of racialized township residents in post-apartheid South Africa. Most recently, Professor Mirafta focused on immigrants and displaced laborers in the United States that culminated in a book, Global Heartland, Displaced Labor, Transnational Lives, and Local Placemaking. The book reveals intimate connections in displacement, dispossession and community development processes across the globe, including Mexico, Togo, and Rust Belt United States. Among many books and articles and book chapters, most recent ones include a co-edited volume, Constructing Solidarities for a Humane Urbanism in 2019, and the Rutledge Handbook of Planning Theory, which came in 2017, and Cities and Inequalities in a Global and Neoliberal World in 2015. In 2017, Professor Mirafta received two awards for, the, for her book, Global Heartland, by the Association of Collegiate Social Schools of Planning, Paul Davidoff Book Award, and American Sociological Association Section on Global and Transnational Sociology Best Scholarly Book Award. Thank you, Professor Mirafta, for joining us today, and we look forward to your talk, We Are All Refugees, Informal Settlements, and camps as converging spaces of global displacements. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate this um, nice introduction. And um, thank you, Aisha, for inviting me. Thank you, Anna Kukovic, Kukovic and Clemson Schmidt for, for making all this possible. I, I am grateful and uh, uh, excited. So um, I will keep my uh, presentation shorter and looking forward to the discussion with all of you who I cannot see, but I know you are there. Okay, thank you. So let me share my screen and uh, take it from there. Okay, so you're able to see it, the, the, my, my first page of the PowerPoint. We are all refugees, camps and informal settlements as converging spaces of global displacement is uh, what um, was, um, I will be talking about. It, this is basically, I'm drawing from a paper co-authored with Efad Hook, uh, who is a 
currently PhD candidate at the University of Illinois. And soon, in a few months, he will be assistant professor at, at Smith College. So I hope that he is able to join us uh, for the Q&A. He had a conflict of time, but uh, we might have the benefit of his participation at the end. Um, the motiv what motivated this paper was really the rise of xenophobia, fascism, poor and poor violence that we were observing. Back in 2015, I was, uh, let me hide this uh, band here. I was uh, uh, spending the semester in, in Cape Town, South Africa, and that is when one of the many uh, xenophobic attacks um, in, in townships against African immigrants uh, broke out. And um, uh, following that, of course, in 20, you know, I was, this is while I was finishing up my book on, uh, in Illinois, Global Heartland that was mentioned. And I was observing harsh processes of um, rapid um, diversity of this former um, sundown town or former uh, stronghold of KKK that was now going through rapid transformation by arrival of non-citizens, so to speak, and non-US-born um, uh, uh, um, workers. This, you know, I'm getting this band in the, maybe I move it down here. Um, this uh, was followed by also other kinds of conflicts that were happening uh, in Bangladesh where Afad was working, uh, in particular, the, the violence against Rohingyan refugees that were displaced from Myanmar to Bangladesh. So um, all of these kind of um, um, xenophobic and, and also um, poor and poor violence was happening in the context of um, rising um, turn to right-wing anti-immigrant uh, sentiments in Europe uh, against arrival of um, immigrants to Europe, um, as well as actually the seating of the head clan, I would say Trump, in the White House of the Uni United States as the, as the uh, um, top white supremacist um, position, uh, top position to have in, in that um, um, relation. So, this, this kind of rise of xenophobic fasc xenophobia, fascism, poor and poor um, violence, of course, was happening in the context of growing and unprecedented global displacements. UNCHR actually uh, announced that by 20, during 2020, we will exceed 80 million refugees and internally displaced people as well as asylum seekers. This is an unprecedented uh, number. And every 24, uh, every minute, there are 24 people who get uh, displaced. So these are shocking um, numbers. And along with that, we also know of the growing inequalities globally within cities as well as across regions. But uh, globally, we know that 1 billion are estimated by UN habitat are slum dwellers, basically poor um, urban uh, population. So precarious uh, lives of these uh, growing uh, displaced people are, are in two kinds of settings. They find shelter in um, informal settlements, and in camps. Informal settlements are those that people or inhabitants do not have legal claim to their uh, shelter. And camps are supposedly shelter that is temporary for people who have been displaced from um, due to, it could be war or crime uh, or, or climate change or uh, reasons vary. Um, but camps are supposedly temporary shelters for refugees or internally displaced people and asylum seekers. Of course, camps and informal settlements are spaces that originate differently and serve different purposes. But while they are not the same, they often resemble and blur into each other as they evolve in context-specific ways. 
Informal settlements may hold displaced refugees indeed, or people in refugee-like situations. And camps may also hold citizens that are um, impoverished. So we suggest that the lived experiences um, of these two growing groups, informal settlement dwellers and refugees or refugee-like population, seem to be more intertwined than separate. We ask in lived experiences of poor and displaced people, how much in, 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 in their real experience, in their lived experience, how much does it really make a difference whether you have membership of a nation state recognized, whether you have national citizenship or not, right? And we move this discussion forward by focusing on experiences of informal um, settlement dwellers and reflecting on cities we have uh, researched on. I, as um, Aisha mentioned, have worked in as informal settlements of cities in Latin America, as well as in South Africa. And uh, Efad had um, research in Bangladesh, in Dhaka, Bangladesh. So we reflected on those ethnographic uh, work that we had already uh, for, uh, among informal settlement uh, dwellers and uh, read the literature on refugees uh, through, you know, we read the experiences of these informal settlement dwellers through the lens of literature on refugees, right? We have often seen it the other way around, reading the experience of refugees through the lens of informal settlements. We wanted to do it the other way around and see how could we see the experiences of informal settlement dwellers uh, through the lens of refugee literature and what are the similarities and differences. Of course, we, we, uh, what we found and we, uh, what I hope that we can share with you in the remainder of the session is that lived realities of right-bearing citizens in informal settlements are comparable to those of a stateless refugees. That's really the main point that we want to get across. So in doing so, we are not trying to make direct comparisons uh, we are rather inspired by Gillian Hart's ra uh, relational comparisons and by insights into relational comparisons that Aisha Kagler and Nina Glick Schiller's uh, work on relational multiscalar analysis, which uh, offers, which locates migrants and non migrants within the same analysis of city making processes. We interrogate the similarities and differences in production and governance of urban space for poor supposedly citizens living in informal settlements and for poor, often stateless um, people in camps. We pay attention to key processes, relations, and practices that produce and govern informal settlements and camps. And in that sense, we avoid the trap of direct comparison by allowing us to understand phenomena a city, a place, a community, in this, in this case, a refugee camps and, and uh, informal settlements, not in and of itself, but in relation to other processes and places through relations with wider arenas, right? So relying on relational approach, in this paper, we do not compare pre-existing objects or spaces, for example, informal settlements or camps as pre-existing objects. The focus is rather on how these spaces are constituted in relation to one another and through power-seeking practices in multiple interconnected arenas of everyday life. So we benefit from two bodies of literature, informal settlements and uh, literature on camps. And I take few minutes uh, only to just give some gesture of this literature that I, we thought is most relevant to the discussion today for this presentation. Otherwise, each of these bodies of literature could be hours of, of discussion and summary. So for informal settlements, I um, want to highlight the extensive literature on informality, predominantly in urban scholarship that uh, theorizes 
um, salams through informal and insurgent practices of claim making. Basically, in, in, uh, in dwellers of these settlements live outside the legality of a state, or what Oren Yevdechel calls in gray spaces, somewhere, somewhere between legal and illegal. The literature on informality reveals that for majority urban poor, the promise of liberal democratic citizenship for protection is a false one. They do not have what they have. They do not access what they do access. Their shelter is not because of their um, um, state, the, the relationship with the state, but is despite the state, right? So they use all sorts of images from what I call invited and inv invented the spaces of action to access what they need for dignified livelihoods. Sometimes they use their means of the state and its agencies and the spaces of participation. Other times they use protests and other means to make their claims to the city. And of course, in this process, as capitalist state and its neoliberal formation has privatized public goods and the city itself as a whole, they, 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 a host of NGOs and non-governmental organizations, and as I will mention later, humanitarian uh, agencies um, are in charge of, of um, working with these um, or satisfying the very basic necessities in informal settlements. At the center of all of these voluntary work is of course, poor women. Camp literature, which we often associate with um, discrete spaces like at Zatari camp uh, in, in Jordan that you see, which overnight they are makeshift and built, um, I call them instant urbanization. Al Zatari, for example, um, uh, shelters 85,000 or it started with 85,000. So we associate camps with these kind of discrete contained spaces, but um, are, are we use in our work a much broader um, um, variations in ideas of camps, including urban refugees that live inside cities and are adjacent to cities and become integrated part of the urban um, lives, right? Uh, and I will share with that. Let me first mention that a salient literature on camps is situated predominantly in anthropology and has focused on growing population that contained in the socio-spatial realities of camps. Earlier conceptualization of camps as zones of bare life, as per Agamba's formulation, has been heavily critiqued and, and a more um, politicized rethinking of camps has since developed. Michelle Agui, um, Aguirre has been very important in, in um, and, and other anthropologists, of course, in specifying the agency that camps and uh, in refugees exert in camps in negotiating their lives within the camps and also outside with adjacent um, areas. So the understanding, the understanding of camps as um, um, sites of active social and political life and also stressing the everyday negotiations of, of refugees and the camp's porosity and evolving interrelations with their surroundings. Um, and the spillover effect of, of camps often has uh, uh, been very important because sometimes the, um, as um, I will show with, with few images in Shatila refugee camp in Beirut, um, uh, the camp would blend into metropolitan area, in this case, metropolitan Beirut's misery belt of informal settlements. And as Martin suggests, the camps are no longer in the space as a spatial device that separates refugees from citizens. Camps now could also be devices to separate or they are sites where citizens are divided between basically then categorized as deserving and undeserving of a state protection. So some of those citizens who are undeserving of state protection end up in where refugee camps were supposed to be. And some of those refugees that are supposedly stateless end up and they spill over and they become part of 
an integral part of the fabric of the city. Again, in Shatila, I will share some images of that. Um, but this is spillover, uh, Romola uh, Sanyal reminds us, could also be problematic in that often these groups are pitted against each other, right? The potential complications when urban refugees spill over, then they are pitted against other urban poor. And um, um, that is something that to, to, I will come back to, and, and I think it motivates also studies like this. So contemporary cities um, and, um, are uh, sites that receive and produce displaced people. Right. This is very important that uh, contemporary cities, we see how it does both of those things. And in that sense, we could see it as a site of urban humanitarian crisis uh, and uh, where we can concretely see urban humanitarian crisis. And that is where the lines between citizens and refugees and between informal settlements and camps could blur. And therefore, what we call in, you know, the, our call for, we are all refugees. Now, uh, going into the substance of, of the argument after this um, introduction, we, uh, for the rest of the, the presentation, I will share with you um, our thoughts and reflections that are in seeing relationship between these two or overlapping realities of these two groups and spaces, we organize our um, uh, thoughts around, around three themes, uh, experiential, institutional, and political or micro-political, and how the two groups, informal settlement dwellers and refugee uh, dwellers, uh, refugee camp dwellers, while one is supposedly has legal citizenship and the other one supposedly doesn't, how their re lived realities in respect to these three elements are um, more similar than different or are intercomparable. Okay, I want to first uh, share with you, you know, that I chose uh, Shatila, uh, refugee camp in Beirut, where I visited in 2019. My guide was uh, Donia Ezzedin. I don't know if she is in the audience. I hope she is, and I hope she will join us in the Q&A. And she has extensive work in Shatila, and um, some of the, her thesis work uh, that I am using in this presentation, you will see um, the credit. And some of the other images are what I took during my um, um, visit. Um, but I will use the example of Shatila camp in Beirut that I visited in 2019, and I will use an, the example of an informal settlement in Mumbai, uh, Malvani fishing village, an informal settlement that I visited in 2016. So I thought they, at least in spatially, they looked more similar, and I thought for the purpose of this presentation is more useful. In the paper, we use ethnographic work in, uh, from Bangladesh. So uh, in uh, Shatila is a, is a uh, refugee camp that was created in 1949 or 48 um, after attacks of Israeli and occupation uh, by Israel. And they, they fled to Beirut and Shatila camp, one and a half square kilometers, became home of 9,000. It started with 9,000 Palestinian refugees. Uh, today, as uh, this is as Dunya Mohammed uh, as a Dean's uh, thesis shows, it is actually much larger. It has a, um, almost 15,000 residents, and they are a mix of Syrians, Lebanese, as well as Palestinians. So this is the map that and and data that uh, Dunya's research offers us. Right, but one of the pictures that she, uh, aerial photos that she uses is very important in what we were talking about earlier, that almost Shatila camp is indistinguishable from the surrounding. The homogeneity of the area is noticeable in this aerial photo. Um, uh, the other um, drawings that she has created is, and, and is very helpful, is um, 
um, the, the process by which the refugees, um, they changed their individual units, right? And built, extended it horizontally and vertically. Actually, some of the Shatil, uh, Shatil of sites, you know, which were just one unit, are now multiple units and have built on top of each other. The tallest was nine floors. This drawing that uh, Dunya offers, you see the lowest is one floor. This is seven floor, uh, five floors, this line, and this is seven floors. And it shows you how, how the densification of this camp, which is, as, as mentioned, is no longer just the Palestinians, but a mix of Lebanese citizens, as well as newer arrival um, uh, Syrian refugees. These are um, some of the images that I took during the visit. And you can see that each time they built one floor more, they extend out to the point that by the time you are getting to the third or fourth floor, the, the alleyway that used to be open space is almost closed. And all those features of informal settlements, that is mm, connections of water and electricity from one unit to the other, from one floor to the other, it's familiar scene for those of us who have spent time in informal settlements. These are further uh, images that I took in uh, Shatila uh, in Beirut. Okay, and, and in terms of relationship with the adjacent, this is the, um, this, the street that basically used to separate the camp from the rest, but now the blend that porosity we were talking about is completely intangible when you uh, go from one space to the other. And the, 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 the commercial space is shared by surrounding areas as well. These are images that Dunya uses in her um, thesis, or maybe she sent me directly, I'm not sure, but she took these images from the tallest building within Shatila refugee camp of the surrounding um, area. Okay, so now, again, we see this kind of incremental building happening in informal settlements. It's very well documented, um, and, and I want to relate it and I'm not using some of the other work I have done, but I thought the more actually visually comparable was this fishing village and informal settlement in Mumbai that I visited in 2016. They are an economic, you could say, refugees. They are going to, they were under the threat of dislocation and um, displacement because of the project of this freeway that in Mumbai was to be built, which would have affected all the fishing villages and, and informal settlements that along the coast by, by disrupting the ecology of, of the bay. So visiting this um, um, informal settlements, you could see that by they were under threat of losing their livelihood, right? And being dislocated. This, this was a real um, fear and, and threat that they were organizing and working to be heard. Um, and I am not sure that this has succeeded, but the, 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 what started as a fishing village is of course with the growth of the city and metropolitan area and a greater need for, or, or uh, people with precarious lives and um, need for, affordable shelter moved in and they have also built in. So this uh, fishing village is now an informal settlement with multiple uh, floors. And um, as you could see, it's very similar to how you extend out and go above and that way you create further for new arrivals and new uh, populations that come in. These are the uh, some of the images from the uh, informal settlement in Mumbai. So with this kind of brief show and tell, um, I want to now go into those three uh, organizing themes of, the, of um, uh, how we see uh, similarities <clears throat> or overlapping realities uh, between the two groups. Uh, I start with experiential, right? That 
how the, the uh, precarity in everyday lives of poor people, both those living in camps and in formal settlements, are really representing the precarious relationships to citizenship, right? Spending, uh, suspending camps in regimes of permanent temporariness. This is the term we borrow from Picker and Pasquetti, um, Pasquetti, which they talk about permanent temporariness in camps as a necessary condition for territorial control, domination, and governance of refugees. But we see that temporary, um, permanent temporariness also being the case for informal settlements and dwellers with their precarious lives. They also are often fearing their relocation or this location and displacement, like the fishing village, the informal settlement at the um, Mumbai Bay that I shared with you, they too fear and don't know whether from one day to the next, they will be at the whims of the political change and they will be um, bulldozed, removed and displaced. Uh, they are also under constant threat of eviction, fires, demolition, and they wait for rehabilitation and recognition of rights or workable relocation. In these settlements, symbolic citizenship, we argue, is under question, substantive citizenship is lacking, and, for, and some form of holistic citizenship stands always on the horizon. And for that, we use the term citizenship is in wait. Right For both groups, the refugees are hoping relocation or admission to a third um, country and, 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 and membership and citizenship. And for informal settlements who have the formal citizenship, they are always hoping to access those substantive citizenship rights in future. And that is the citizenship in life in way that we um, in, uh, talk about as um, inhabitants being in permanent state of temporariness. Because informal settlement dwellers cannot easily move out to other parts of the city or back to their origin, and because the disruptive events of demolition, evictions, floods, and fires uh, or is the everyday life of dwellers, this, this is something that we call they are subject of in situ displacement, right? So, a lot of informal settlement dwellers and those of us who have worked in this field, we know that they are displaced people from rural areas or they are displaced from gentrification in other urban areas to informal settlements where they can't afford it. And sometimes they are in situ displacements. For example, recently in Ocean View, a community in Cape Town that I have been for over a decade working um, within and with their um, housing assembly organizations. They had fires and people were again, right? In same sites where they lost everything and had to renew, re, uh, restart again. So these are situations that could be referred to as in situ displacements and um, commonalities and, and permanent temporariness of the experiences, experiential uh, realities of the two groups. I move on to the second um, organizing theme or overlapping reality around institutions, right? In camp literature, the notion of humanitarian governance looms large. Humanitarian care it is argued, alleviates suffering, saves vulnerable lives, and lays the groundwork for sustainable and secure life. But humanitarianism is also understood as an ideology that mobilizes a range of meanings and practices to establish and sustain global relations of domination without seeking political solutions addressing root causes behind global crisis. Michel Aguirre, for example, calls humanitarianism the left hand of empire. In the long institutional career of humanitarianism, we must note an important shift in the UN um, humanitarian, United Nations humanitarian action 
Marianne Pivot, who has studied how the institution has changed its strategies, marks a sharp shift, a radical shift in the 1960s, where UN humanitarian action shifts from a legal protection toward a material regime, basically providing um, services, infrastructure, roads, clinics, schools, all of these kinds of um, mat ma uh, material um, offerings that is now shifted to humanitarian agencies and to the work of UNCHR, right? This is a very important um, 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 consideration. And we see that this humanitarian um, form of governance and humanitarian agencies, humanitarian materiality is not limited to camps where they started, but also informal settlements are very much forgotten or kind of not bothered by the nation state. And they are very much um, the, the agent, these NGOs and uh, um, or, or, um, organizations with humanitarian agenda are the way in which informal settlements are provided access to water, schools, clinics, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but it's, it's an, an example of this, how important are the similar agencies or organizations for both groups is considering, for example, in Bangladesh, Dhaka, where Efad has documented that when humanitarian agencies provided support for Rohingyans in refugee camps, they had to immediately provide that those same support, food parcels, whatever they were, for the surrounding informal settlements, because they knew informal settlements do not have, they are in a dire situation as refugees are, and they didn't want to have basically violence breaking out but by informal settlements on refugees in the camps. So they had to extend their humanitarian aid, so to speak, from camps to adjacent informal settlements. The magnitude of humanitarian care in the context of Bangladesh, a country that is the size of a, one state in US, Georgia state, okay, could be a, a sobering um, reality check. According to the government in um, Bangladesh, close to 2,500 NGOs are in operation. BRAC, um, one of the largest NGOs in, in Bangladesh, has an operating budget of $300 million and employs over 108,000 staff. So we are talking about mm, mm, parallel or uh, governments, um, parallel state in this case. So camps and uh, informal settlement dwellers rely on globalized apparatus of physical and institutional structures of humanitarian in intervention to survive. Both of them are using similar, uh, same actors and overlapping roles and responsibilities for both groups. The replicated presence of NGOs along with their relation to the state, we argue produces a specific informal settlements and camps as new global governmental spaces operating at a calculated distance from states. We want to hear challenge or, or basically um, make sure that there is no confusion, that these are not independent of state, they are at a calculated distance from the state. Um, so, but IDS like camp dwellers are, are not passive recipients of global charity. Their everyday experiences of symbolic and material precarity leads slum dwellers, slum dwellers to make demands on humanitarian organizations and vocalize alternative pathways of land development within these new governmental spaces and you know, I often have written that NGO stands for new governmental uh, organizations as opposed to non-governmental organizations. Within these new governmental spaces, as we shall see in the next uh, section, we see novel forms of political contestation that, place, uh, that take place and dwellers 
as political actors craft a space of power between the state and humanitarian governance, what we call it interstitial power. Those everyday practices, um, negotiations that, and contestations that is source of power for these supposedly um, disempowered, um, marginalized um, urban or, or inhabitants, I said supposedly. Um, camps are not merely sites of despair at the mercy of humanitarianism and goodwill of charities and nonprofit organizations, nor is that the case uh, neither for informal settlement dwellers nor for refugee camps. We are much better familiar with agency exerted by urban informal settlement dwellers and then with what happens, how these things are negotiated in refugee camps. But um, as a literature tells us, in, they, in camps also, um, they are not mere sites of containment and management, but also sites of contestation. Um, Romola Sanyal, for example, documenting Palestinian refugee camps in Beirut, shows refugees enact agency through their micro politics of a squatting and occupying land, building shelters against the dictates of the state and, uh, and the like. In Al Zatari camp that I showed earlier, that uh, I called it uh, overnight um, urbanizations or instant urbanizations in Jordan, one of my former students, um, Tuma uh, Zakluli, has um, documented, and he, in his, for his master's thesis, where refugees initiated small business and income generating activities, despite the humanitarian agencies that controlled the camp and restrained them. Um, the guidelines was that you were not able, allowed to do that, but they were running such kind of income generating activities within the camp. So there are many, many uh, examples in literature how uh, even refugee in refugee camps, they uh, negotiate uh, power. And sometimes they um, use um, the state against humanitarian agencies or humanitarian agencies against the, 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 uh, the state or pitching, um, um, pitching them against each other or finding their space within each of these uh, spaces. So, conceptualizing the lived experiences of informal settlement dwellers in relation to camp literature reveals emerging spaces of global governance and political contestations where dwellers in both sides live under a regime of imposed precarity and citizenship in weight. In both cases, the state agencies are of course present, but their presence is not direct as in the conventional state-centered theorization of citizenship that assumes in the liberal democratic theorization, um, in theorization of citizenship in the liberal democratic model, the assumption is that membership in a state, um, uh, in, in the national uh, political community would automatically provide you with all the other rights, substantive rights to shelter and life, et cetera, et cetera, and political rights. The state presence in both the refugee camps and informal settlements is often accomplished by other means, often through other global and supposedly non-governmental organizations. But this is the concept of citizenship from below as Gaventa and Halston and a whole range of other theorists have talked about an insurgent citizenship or citizenship from below, how people make meaning and make it real, not as a bundle of right granted about from above. Seeing the ontological blurring between informal settlements and camps in a specific instances is crucial for a new grassroots politics that organizes the globally dispossessed across citizens and refugee divides. So here I want to conclude and go back to but basically what motivated the study that I where I started the presentation with. In conclusion, while conceptually and politically, the two groups are often distinguished by their distinct citizenship status, but their lived reality do not support such distinction. 
Politically, this mirroring of realities between informal settlements and camps has significant implications for the efforts of activists in overcoming citizenship-centered divides and constructing solidarities. A lot of those divides that I saw in Beerstown, for example, in, and that was supporting the nativist narratives of immigrants take our jobs, you come here and, and you are not a citizen and you should not, um, you are basically, we want an America first kind of, that kind of narrative and that makes divides poor against poor based on their legal status or citizenship. We hope this kind of work, that the work that Aisha and Nina have done as that I started with between immigrants, non-immigrants, or the work here that we seek to show the similarities between refugees and informal settlements, we hope that could help in building, building solidarities and, and taking away possibilities of um, white supremacist nationalist discourse that pitches one poor against the other based on their membership uh, formal citizenship status. In this age of intensified global displacements where the drums of hatred and division are beaten loudly to position refugees against the urban poor, we need to show that politics of citizenship within grassroots, grassroots and poor people is illusionary. As anti-refugee, anti-immigrant and racist xenophobic sentiments place one poor group against the other, we have the moral and political obligation to reveal the similarities between citizens, non-citizens, between informal settlements and refugee camps to gesture towards potential to forge solidarity and collective action for populations to intertwine uh, marginalization and struggles. It is only through an understanding of shared struggles that solidarity can be reached. One example is when under Trump, uh, the massive attack on immigrants was launched in 2016 and, and, built, uh, and later. Shortly after, the two organizations in Chicago, one was working against displacement within the city through gentrification, at Autonomous Tenants Union. They were working with Latinos, the residents of the poor residents of Chicago neighborhood that were fighting against displacement due to gentrification. They joined another organization that was focused on uh, deportation, right? They were working against deportation. They combined, they joined force through OCAT, organized communities against uh, displacement and deportation. So they joined force. They realized that our struggle against deportation and displacement are shared struggles. So those are the kind of uh, solidarities that we hope instead of pitching against each other, we are engaged in scholarship, um, activist scholarship, so to speak. When scholarship with, with a political responsibility and commitment could bring up and make expose or make uh, help for to forge these solidarities. Because global capitalism produces and feeds, uh, feeds off intense processes of displacement, it is urgent that the social and spatial dimensions of such processes be taken seriously, both locally and globally, and that the instability in categories of belonging based on national racialized and ethnicized identities be acknowledged. I think for having this called, at least virtually positioned in Vienna in Europe, where we have seen so much of this hatred against um, former colonies, um, people from former colonies coming to Europe uh, now as, as refugees and being rejected is, is um, um, in, is, is more than ever before important. I stop here and I want to end with this picture I took in um, Istanbul International Airport. I just like that to, to the juxtaposition. Thank you, I stop here. Thank you very much, Faranak. That is, this is, this is very interesting, very impressive and politically one feels very much at home. Uh, uh, in your talk and 
thank you for a very clear end in terms of showing also these entanglements between and the impossibility of that making those kind of divisions on the basis of kind of a liberal understanding of citizenship and to understand not only the daily lives but also political subjectivities of mm -hmm. A, a, of the groups of people that we are talking about. Um, we have several questions, but before starting, or actually I'm not going to start myself, that I will give the floor and I will put myself a little bit down on the, uh, on the list. There is a question from uh, uh, Aisha. Shall, can I, before you start the question, just I am curious to know, is my co-author a fad hook on this? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. And also, yes. is uh, Dunya as a Zin yes. who yes. her, is, yes. they're both here. So yes. I want to let the audience know that uh, wonderful Efad and Dunya are with us, and I will invite them whenever yes. needed to participate in the Q&A. Hi, Efad. I see your uh, camera is on now. Yes. And uh, actually, I was also going to say that that anyone who had lived, um, who has an experience of informal settlements in uh, particular parts of the world, this kind of horizontal and the vertical, that is really, I think this is what uh, um, very Mm, familiar uh, development, the process that we see, but showing this in the camp is, I think, was uh, very interesting, at least uh, mm -hmm. for me, that the, the camp that, that it grew. So uh, we have a question from uh, Elena Esawe, uh, and it is about the, um, of course, she's tanking. Do your framework also apply to favelas in Brazil? And especially also landless peasant movement. So how, how, how could we stretch it to not only with the camps and then informal settlements, but also landless uh, peasants. So um, I'm not gonna collect right now. I will just give you the floor to uh, respond to this one or unless you want me to collect. No, no, I will respond to this one. And, and uh, of course, uh, Efad and uh, Dunya, whenever needed, please uh, compliment, join in. Uh, so favelas and uh, Brazilian context, um, MTST and MST, these are important movements uh, in Brazil that precisely they are not fooled by claims of you know, citizens expecting that the state will step in and provide them with their means of livelihood, be it land as well as uh, shelter. So they are very much um, organizations that practice citizenship from below. They take their rights to livelihood in their own hands, right? So in this case, what, we, what I was talking about informal settlement dwellers would apply to those who are not even yet having an informal settlement. They are not yet having a shelter in an informal settlement, but they are organizing, mobilizing to access that. So um, that is, or are living in transitionary situations to get there. So that is um, definitely um, a yes. Okay. Um, we have another question from John Sujivale from University of Vienna. Could you explain us a little bit more about how you explain micropolitics theoretically? You had given us, in our, uh, I think, ample amount of examples, but uh, asking uh, for kind of a little bit expansion theoretically. Mm -hmm. So micropolitics is really um, refers to those politics that is out, I mean, Efad would, would add to it, 
But for me, micropolitics are those political actions that are not within the formal structure of political parties. So those um, politic, it's political work that is happening outside the formal structures of political, but also through oftentimes invisible, you know, everyday interactions, everyday actions, those what we call it interstitial spaces, those actions that could be very small and even um, sometimes purposefully made invisible. You don't want it to be seen because you don't want to get attacked or recognized or controlled. And sometimes it's just the, the, the formal structures don't even recognize the value of it. So there are many examples of my micro politics. Even I, in some cases, you know, I, I have often written in, you know, through the feminist lens, the work that women do, poor women do, in informal settlements or in general for life making is often those channels that are under the radar, unnoticed, micro everyday practices of life making. It's just micro politics. Efot, do you want to add to it, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much for holding this conversation. Um, I think one more aspect of um, micro politics is that um, camp dwellers and, and informal settlement dwellers. Um, find themselves dwelling against both the state and the humanitarian regimes. Sometimes at the same time, they're, they're you know, fighting against both. Um, and other times they also deploy those resources of one regime against another to reach their political goals. So this kind of political agency that they have in, in navigating in between these different regimes and playing one against the other, uh, not always in benevolent ways, but um, but that's the kind of uh, that space of action is what we wanted to think about more and create space to you know uh, bring into attention through uh, micropolitical. Okay, um, thank you. Um, we have another person from University of Vienna, Daniela Paredes. How do the bodies of literature that you referred relate to the literature on this disaster displacement? So wanting to connect or separate, I don't know that. Uh... So I don't necessarily see uh, disaster displacement as a special category. So when we talk about this broader category of um, camps, and we said it's uh, refugee and refugee likes uh, like people. So they are, um, yeah. So it 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 they could be in camps as contained, or they could be in in um, different formations, relocations that have happened. So I don't think that that there is any uh, particular kind of displacement. So it could be internally displaced people. Could it be war? Could it be climate change? Could it be disaster? Um, could it be violence? You know, all of those that basically might internally displace people or might displace them across the, the border. So economic refugees are also within this category. So I think I, I wouldn't uh, categorize as um, displacements that are as a result of environmental or in natural, so to speak, uh, disasters in any uh, separate category. I think this is broader general displacements that we are talking, could be economic, could be disaster, could be other means. Um, thank you very much. Actually, this uh, brings me to my question very well, uh, uh, right away. Um, in terms of the, uh, I mean, as I understand also, and I very much agree, uh, looking at them through the lens of displacement, actually beyond all those kinds of categories and that kind of di divides. And in terms of that, so bringing them through a kind of a common analytical lens, I'm very much. Uh, uh, with you, but I'm thinking about the political consequences of choosing or um, um, polit the merits for political action for choosing in terms of 
when you say we are all refugees, because it is such a loaded term and then a kind of the kind of the imaginary. So what I hear is that more about the solidarity or commoning through commoning politics through of the dispossessed or of the displaced. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering when you choose, we are all refugees. Are you referring to a kind of a, um, a one um, specific case or is it a kind of a call to mm -hmm. understand this for political uh, action? Because I see that the kind of the example you gave, where that the people from the um, gentrif uh, displaced for gentrification were allying together with the uh, people who are against deportation. So I think these are very valuable, very important uh, empirical cases to build upon politically also, and we have seen that in uh, in Europe also, uh, these kind of uh, activities. But to put that in terms of saying that we are all migrants or we are all refugees, I'm thinking about the kind of the political consequences of that mm -hmm. in, uh, as a political motto or agenda. This is one question. The other question I have is in relation to citizenship from below. Um, I do understand very well what you mean by citizenship uh, from below. And uh, Fadul's uh, explanation was also that how they play, uh, sometimes not in a benevolent way, but how they play depending on the context, on the situation, and that, that the state and the humanitarian uh, uh, agencies and that aid. Um, and given the frame that you presented to us about the uh, heavy presence of NGOs and the, uh, and the emphasis on participatory empowerments, projects, those kinds, um, how useful is it to still remain within the kind of citizenship from above and from below? Because that below might be very much entangled with the what we understand from the state agencies or NGOs who are very difficult to differentiate, like new government <laughs> organizations, as you referred. So I'm wondering whether we could push that or we could get beyond that from above and from below. Thank you. I started and I thought could continue. Uh, so in using this title for our paper and the talk today, we are all refugees. We really were thinking of all the poor people. So we, all, all, we here is referring to poor people. And when you are poor, the nation state in South Africa was, you know, this was, you know, as I said, for me it was motivation was what, I don't know what happened with her side, on her side. Um, what I was referring was also actually what you were saying, building upon that too. So do you want to pick it up? It's up to you. Yeah, I think what you were saying is really important because uh, there has been an earlier uh, you know, group of uh, scholarship that's looked at, you know, that worked up op operating in this binary of citizenship as formally understood in citizenship from below. And I think the kind of um, empirical processes that we are looking at, they sort of cut through those kinds of very strong binaries. And I think that's one of the things that uh, Faranax invited invented spaces that she talks about in other work kind of tries to get at how, you know, there is no such binary spaces where um, things happen totally separately. So I think what your point about how, you know, uh, citizenship from below is 
not as a tenable concept anymore, I, I would agree with you. I align with you on that. And I think um, the more we look at what are the lived experiences of people living somewhere in this messy middle, in these entangled you know, life spaces. Uh, and I think if we are able to generate our understanding from those experiences, um, and that's why we, we developed these, you know, we started thinking about the citizenship in weight and in situ displacement mm -hmm. and how those are the kind of messy sort of, you know, experiences that people are going through and living. And, um, and it's not as, as clear cut as just, you know, totally outside citizenship, totally outside state. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Farhanak, do you hear us? Uh, okay. So oh. I don't know what happened. I am now on my phone, <laughs> on my mobile phone, using data because the internet somehow, I, it says it's connected, but it's not working. Yeah. So I am using data on my cell phone and apologize if, okay. Uh, okay. yeah, no problem. sorry about that. No problem, no problem. And meanwhile, actually, Afadul was kind enough to pick up the kind of the citizenship from below and then above, and then you have explained actually who do we are in the yeah. we are all refugees because very often we say that that's a kind of a um yeah. it gets lost in... i wanted to add to one thing because i think that mm -hmm. um is is come often becomes you know the sore point there is no, and Afar and I have had this discussion, there is no way that, and in other work that I do, when I write about insurgent citizenship and insurgent planning, insurgent practices of the poor, there is no way that we are undermining that, you know, get, letting the state off the hook. It's not. State is not off the hook. It is, state is actually the target of these mobilizations, the target of these grassroots activism from below, claiming their rights. When I say they are, they have what they have, despite the state, not because of a state, is that they don't have an illusion to wait for their you know, turn, for the state to, to serve them. They don't have that illusion. They know they have to, from below, exert pressure and you know, political manipulation and political pressure and whatever it takes to get their rights, but they don't have the, the, the illusion that if they sit, it would be our turn, the state would reach us. I also want to make a distinction between national citizenship and urban citizenship. We live in a time that oftentimes, as I'm sure your work in the, uh, among immigrants and non-immigrants shows, it's urban citizenship, it's localities where we live that we can assert and exercise our rights to livelihood and whatever we can accomplish. Not necessarily a piece of paper that says you are a member of the citizen. So in that sense, challenging the formalistic legal citizenship doesn't mean that we are saying, oh, we just from below, we will help each other and help ourselves and manage our lives and don't worry about the state and its monopoly on violence and and it's it's all the institutional support that is giving to the uh, um the, the the affluent or the one percent so i wanted to make that clarity also okay. thank you very much uh Faranak. we have one question from valentina grillo and also from university of vienna um could you please elaborate on the bangladeshi experience on the ground this is the reality of a border <laughs> region where refugee camps often overlap with host communities what role does border play in your understanding okay so uh if I, shall i let you reflect on the bangladeshi you know rohingya um, refugees uh, camps and it's basically the way I understood that these camps was very much connected and in, you know to the to the informal settlements surrounding them so in that sense borders are many I mean I'm just talking uh, abstractly I haven't done work in Bangladesh per se but borders are many borders one of them is the border that na nation state sets for us but there are borders along constructions socially constructed along religion in case of Rohingyans, you know, and, and being this 
displaced from uh, Myanmar. So it could be ethnicity, racialized borders, um, uh, religion, etc. I want to, before I turn it to a thought, I want to just share one example from the Global Heartland Project on notion of citizenship and how, when, when we challenge it, when I challenge that understanding of formalistic, legalistic, um, as a bundle of rights that nation state gives or doesn't give, was the, the dynamics between African immigrants mm -hmm. and African Americans. So in the eyes of the um, dominant US born of European descent population, we call it racialized white uh, Beerstownians, in their eyes, African Americans and West Africans were both you know, they African Americans had no privilege over the other ones for membership in the nation state for being US citizens, right? If anything, they were in one of the narratives, actually, they refer to them as we have two kinds of African immigrants, the ones from Detroit and the ones from Togo. So this the borders are really the, this idea of a national border that creates you are inside or outside is extremely context and political and you know very varies very much and it's, when they say it's socially constructed it's around multiple dimensions ethnicity race religion and one would be this um, physical borders. Um, I thought if you want to yeah. bring in. Sure. I'll, I'll add a little bit to that, which is um, uh, speaking to the Rohingya uh, experiences and in you know, a refugee displacement in Bangladesh. Um, I think that uh, we um, that played a role in the way we thought about how humanitarianism kind of works across informal settlements and camps. That was a very important point for us, because um, I mean, all of you know about the Rohingya crisis and the you know displacement of Rohingyas from Myanmar through this ethnicized and racialized conflict. And uh, in in case of Bangladesh, the NGOs that are working in the refugee camps are also providing similar resources and support to the poor communities around these camps in order to avoid conflicts, in order to not generate conflict. So, um, so there is this kind of you know. Uh, material presence of the same humanitarian organizations across camp and the local communities there. Uh, also, um, NGOs that I work with in the context of Dhaka, they work in the context of Rohingya camps also. And the programs that they have created, for example, particularly uh, women's health related, health rights related uh, advocacy programs that they created uh, for the camps are in a way, a replication of the work that they have been doing in Dhaka's informal settlements. So those programs and policies and the, from the very literature itself, I mean, the texts that they generate, the reports that they generate are a, um, a sort of replication and um, that knowledge that they have gathered and experience that they have gathered in the, in, the, in the informal settlements are what they're using as a basis to build those programs in the camps. So those are two important ways that we saw how borders also become very porous when we look through this lens. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And actually, I think that that's why when we when I started that for the series, we said that um, trying to produce knowledge on forced migration and bordering regimes. So it is all mm -hmm. not, it is not simply borders, but bordering practices Absolutely. and, and regimes. And I think that your article that, I mean, your work on, in, which became actually, I think the basis of the global heartland that shows very well with the African Americans and then the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the immigrants and um, uh, I, I, I think all my students have read that. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm uh, very happy that you refer to that. We have another question. I think this would be the maybe the last question. Why it is by Rui Marquez uh, Pinto? Uh, why rule of the law is not effective on protection? Those protecting those experiences within a space of exclusion to inclusion. Sorry, <laughs> could you help me get the question? <laughs> um, 
actually uh, why the law is not being effective in terms of turning those experiences of exclusion to an include uh, experiences of inclusion and in yeah. a way why a state is not doing what the state claims yeah. to do <laughs> yeah so it's it's the uh, you know laws are also laws could be sometimes uh good things i mean they are progressive laws are necessary but are not adequate so sometimes they could become means of pacifying movements, basically saying, we gave you this right on the paper. South African post-apartheid transition is a great example. They have one of the most progressive uh, um, constitutions with incredibly uh, progressive rights and laws. I mean, the, the, the constitution says, every human being in South Africa, independent of their racialization categories, et cetera, have, has a right to basic shelter. They have a right to basic services, but these are all rights that are sitting in constitution on a piece of paper. To make them practice, it takes Abashlali, Basamun Jodolo, grassroots movement. It takes housing assembly, movement. It takes um, all the other grassroots movements that are exerting their insisting to practice, to make rights real, to make those raw laws practice. So sometimes laws are unfair and you push to make fair laws, but also when you get laws that are, you know, pro uh, poor or disadvantaged or wretched of the earth, Again, we need a vigilant civil society or people from below to assert, to make those rights, those laws get implemented and is carried through. So I think why it doesn't happen, it's because who is controlling, who is, whose interest is being served by the state, its institutions, as well as its laws that are made and practiced or not practiced or, you know, so. It's, I think the short answer is patriarchal racial capitalism. That's the reason. <laughs> and whose state is that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whose state is, uh, is that? I think we are, uh, I mean, we are, we have exhausted our time. And uh, for some of the questions that I'm not going to uh, pose because uh, we are, we have to finish by uh, six thirty, and uh, I would like to thank you very much, uh, uh, Faranak, for this wonderful talk. And thanks a lot, Fadul. That's I mean, I know that it is a, a joint project, and for your contributions to in the discussion. Uh, I hope that we will be able to continue our conversations in different uh, formats. And as always, I finish that, I mean, uh, uh, keep following us uh, in uh, April uh, on 14th, we will be having Nick Do uh, Nicholas de Geneva in, uh, mm. in our uh, series. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Paranak, for this wonderful talk. And thank you very much for joining and for your very interesting uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thanks for the organizers again. And sorry about having getting disconnected and all the hassle. Okay. I appreciate no it. And it was wonderful. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Bye.